God bless you. God bless you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, worship team. Thank you. Yes, we are in the presence of the Lord. Deliverance is in the presence of the Lord. Joy is in the presence of the Lord. And it's good to be in the presence of the Lord this Sunday morning, this 24th of January. It is great to be in the presence of the Lord. It's also good to have you here joining us, whether it's 10 a.m. or whatever time it is here in Europe, whether it's down in Africa, over in Asia, or even some of you have gotten up early in the morning in the USA and you're online with us this morning. It is a joy to have you sharing with us today. And as, as I always say, this is the day the Lord's made. I am rejoicing, glad to be in it. Also glad to have you here sharing with us today this the Lord's day, this our Sunday morning worship experience. So I greet you in divine love. I greet you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Grab your Bibles, get, grab your Bibles and come with me to Matthew chapter four, verse eight. I've already marked my Bible, so I won't have to do a lot of turning to get there. Matthew chapter four, verse eight. Let me say again, we're having a wonderful time with our uh, morning devotional. We've got people, number of good number of people joining us for our no morning devotional. I think I just believe it's helping some folk understand how to have a wonderful start your day off with a wonderful time of devotion, praise, worship, reading the word. And I'm just believing that this is changing some people's lives, it's changing some homes, changing with some relationships, just because you're putting aside the time to get in the presence of the Lord, to get before the Lord each day in order to start your day off right in his presence. I believe that it is rewarding. Also, first lady told me that the, the yesterday the 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 woe meeting went so long she just had to get to a point just to kind of cut it off because that meeting was going so long. So thank you, ladies, for participating in that yesterday, and uh, I pray that you were blessed as much as she said she was blessed just to be a part of it. Finally, yesterday we had a great time with uh, those of us who using this Logos, Logos Bible software. We spent some time yesterday just walking some folks through some practical tips on how to set it up. And if you haven't joined us, you got two more weeks. Each week is progressive, but you got two more weeks. Uh, we got some others that so would cover new things each week. But uh, let us know if you've got it, if you've got the software and you want to be a part. Uh, inbox us or, or hit me up if you are friends with me on Facebook or if you're not friends, inbox me and we'll, we'll we'll see how to get you in these last two weeks. But I'm telling you, it's been phenomenal and people are understanding that software even better. It's been a joy to share that with the people of God. Amen. So let's let's read Matthew chapter four, verse eight through 10, verses eight through 10. It says, and again, the devil took him up on an exceeding high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. 
Let's pray. Father, I thank you in Jesus' name for the opportunity to open up your word. I pray now that God, now, God, you will cause revelation insight to flow. Open the eyes of our understanding that we might behold the wondrous works in thy law. Flood us with revelation, insight, and instruction. Father, I pray even now that you will honor your son through your word. And at the end, you'll get the glory. You'll get the praise. All the honor belongs to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, in case you don't know, we're in a teaching series of, of we're, we're in a series of lessons teaching uh, under the umbrella of kingdom faith. Today's thought is the glory of the kingdom. Friday, Friday, those of you who joined me on the Noontime Nugget, I gave a preview of today's lesson during our Noontime Nugget. For those of you who wasn't there, let me just drop a couple of things, grab a couple of things from it. I'm not going to cover everything. So if you, it's, it's, it's saved here on Facebook uh, and I actually streamed it to YouTube as well. So those of you watching us on YouTube, it's on YouTube. It, sh it should be on YouTube as well. It's not on online church for those of you watching us on online church, but you can get it on Facebook as well as YouTube, the entire thing. But I'm just going to lift up a couple nuggets, a couple points from the Noontime Nugget and get right into this. They, they, they work together. Again, it was just a preview Preview Friday. So I said to you in the Noontime Nugget, temptation is only possible if they are, are appealing. James chapter 1 verse 14 says, but every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. James chapter 1 15 says, then when lust has conceived, it brings forth sin and sin when it is finished brings forth death. Get this. The temptation is not the problem. The problem is, is when the lust is conceived or that word means when it's taken in, it is then that it becomes sin that, that therefore bringeth forth death. Some of you are familiar with the phrase, don't go window shopping with money in your pocket. Let, let me put it this way. As I did Friday, your five senses are go window shopping every day. Your television, your social media, your your and your internet uses images to take you, if you will, window shopping every day with pop-ups, just showing you stuff to try to get you to invest. Uh, act, they activate your five senses. If you follow them, if, if you lust after them and, and you have the opportunity, then that's like having money in your pocket. That's what the phrase don't go shopping, window shopping with money in your pocket means. See, if you if you go window shopping, you don't have any money in your pocket. Don't matter what you see, right? No matter what you see, it's not go, you, you're, you're not going to buy it because you don't have any money to pay for it. Got it? But your five senses do the same thing through, it, they're enticed. The, 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 the enemy is using the, the media, using social media, using television, using your internet to try to draw you into things to get you to yield to temptation. But 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 as I always say, there are things that tempts one person that another person doesn't even pay attention to. Check out the Noontime Nugget Friday. I gave some examples. I don't have time now because I want to be mind, mindful of your time. So check out the nugget. I gave some examples. First John chapter two, verse 15. Here's what John writes. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If, you, if any man love the world, the love of the father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the father, but is of the world. Love not the world. The word, English word, world, is from Greek transliteration, cosmos. It means the order, the behavior, the fashion, and government of this world system. Now, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 says, Jesus, our high priest, was tempted at all points, like us, but yet without sin. When some people read this Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 verse, or when some people hear that verse, some ask, how could Jesus be tempted? And they give a laundry list of sins from modern time because those sins were not happening during biblical times. So they're like, I don't understand it. He, he wasn't tempted with this because this wasn't around then. I'm glad you came by this TED talk today. I got the answer. The King James says that he was tempted at all points. Greek manuscript, if you read it from the Greek manuscript, and I know some of you are not preachers, so you're not reading the Greek manuscript. That's why you have people like me. I'm going to show you what it says. Here's what it says. 
tempted in all things according to our likeness. Likeness means similar or more precisely similitude. So it's, it's not a specific, it is a similarity. I'm coming to it. I'm coming to the answer. Just hold on. I know some of you want it. Here it comes. So the writer of Hebrews is saying there is something common with the temptations of Jesus and the things that tempt us in 2021. The Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, there's no temptation that you, that no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted, watch here, above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear. So in other words, you go on window shopping and you see something, your five senses get alerted to something. At the same time that your five senses are alerted to something, God gives you a way of escape. But what you have to do is take the way of escape and not yield to what, what your five senses have alerted on. Got it? In, in 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, we find three main points or three areas, main areas of temptation. First, lust of the flesh. Second, lust of the eyes. Third, the pride of life. I believe that these are progressive. Watch now. Flesh speaks of doing. So the lust of the flesh speaks of things that we want to do. Lust of the eye speaks of having, eye buying, things that we want to buy. Pride of life is being. It's, all, it's that whole reputation, ego thing. That's what the pride of life is all about. It's, it's your braggadocious moment. It's, it's your showing off. It, it, it is your demonstrating that you are large and in charge. It's all of that. When you, It's your keeping up with the Joneses. That's all a part. That, that kind of kind of goes between uh, uh, the, the lust of the eyes as well as the pride of life because the pride of life is, is trying to get you to walk in pride to, to say, you know, I'm like everybody else. I can have this, I can have this, and I can have this. And, you know, I'm, I'm not dealing with things. That's not, the, that's, not the, that's not the message today. But understand this. The serpent tempted Eve and ultimately Adam through the lust of the eyes. The first Adam was tempted in the beautiful garden of Eden. Jesus, the second or the last Adam, was tempted in the wilderness. As you know, the first Adam failed, but Jesus, the last or second Adam, did not fall. The first Adam yielded to temptation in a perfect environment. Jesus, the last Adam or second Adam, overcame temptation in an unkept garden, a.k.a. a wilderness. This means, on one hand, there is no safe environment wherein the enemy of your soul will not try and destroy you. On the other hand, Jesus demonstrated as overcomers. We are overcomers through Christ Jesus. As overcomers, we can prevail even in an unkept, a wild, or the worst situations. Even in unkept, wild or worse situations, you and I can still be overcomers. Even though it, you know, it's a wild place, we can still be overcomers. You might be deployed somewhere. You can still be an overcomer. You may be at home alone. You can still be an overcomer. You may be all by yourself. You still can be an overcomer. But at the same time, you can be in the most pristine of situations. You can be in the paradise of God and still mess up because the enemy of your soul is trying to take you out because he don't want you or me to be a demonstrator and overcomer in the kingdom of God. So let's walk through, let's walk through, let's walk through. That's really, that's that's the review or some of the stuff from what I covered Friday, but let me pick up now so, and add some, some additional stuff and get up out of here. Watch. God's original intent was for mankind to have dominion in the earth. When Adam and Eve rebelled against God in the garden, they handed over their dominion to Satan. That means they gave Satan the title deed to the world system. At, at, the, at that point, the world system was conceived. So when Adam and Eve sinned, when they disobeyed God, when they rebelled against God, what they did in essence was handed over the title deed of all the world system. See, before they sinned, everything was perfect. Before their sin, everything was perfect. They when they sinned, though, they opened up fault lines. Let me get let me get ahead of myself and come back to it. What what some of you witnessed on television on January the sixth was a fault line that was opened by Adam. What you saw on January the sixth 
in Washington, D.C. was a fault line that was opened by Adam. All the protests you saw in the USA, around the globe, the stuff you saw yesterday, day before in Russia, those are fault lines as a result of Adam falling in the garden. Are you with me? I, I pray you're with me. I pray you get an understanding here. I pray you get an understanding. See, their obedience allowed Satan to become the God of this world or the prince of this world. Peep this. The NIV in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2 says, this is, this is key to our, to our lesson today. It says, he's the ruler of the kingdom of the air. He's the NIV, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2 says, he's the ruler of the kingdom of the air. This is why he could offer Jesus all the kingdoms of the world. At that point, they were in his control. It's interesting though. Here's what's interesting to me. Here's what interests me, Pastor Newton. Here's what interests me, Pastor Newton. While Jesus rejected the devil's offer, he did not dispute the devil's claim of being able to give him the kingdoms of this world. All right, stick a pen, a marker, a coaster, a bookmark, or, or, or your TV remote. If you have to, just stick your arm there and hold it in Matthew 4, because we're coming back to Matthew 4. Go to uh, Genesis chapter 4, verse 16. Genesis chapter 4. We're coming back to Matthew 4, so just find your way to mark it. You know, if you got to fold your Bible in, go to Genesis chapter 4, verse 16. We're coming back to Matthew 4 real shortly. Genesis chapter 4, verse 16. Let me show you how the first world system in the earth was, was set up. Let me show you how the first worldly system in the earth started to operate. Genesis chapter 4, verse 16. Here's what it says. Then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch, and he built the city and call the name of the city after his after the name of his son Enoch. Watch this. This is about to get good. Notice, Cain went from the presence of the Lord and built the city. He went east of Eden into the land of Nod and built a city. This means Cain built a city that was independent of God. He left the presence of God. So since he's left the presence of God, he's not obviously in the presence of God, which means he's now independent of God. So then watch now, he built the city outside the presence of God. Then he know he knew his wife or they had relations and he, she conceived and bore a son. They named the son Enoch. Here's, here's what happened next. Cain named the city he built that's away from the presence of God after his son, Enoch. The key is that I want you to hear is, is it was away from the presence of God. Note, there are some scholars who believe east of, east of Eden meant Assyria, Babylon, and Persia. Those are the nations that became enemies of Israel. So where were they? East of Eden, but they were also away from the presence of God. So when we go away from the presence of God, we put ourselves in enemy territory. Skip down to verse 20. Verse 20, same chapter, Genesis chapter 4. Skip down to verse 20. Here's what it says. And and immediately, they immediately left their nets and followed. Oh, oh I'm, I'm in, I went back to, I'm sorry. I went back to, to, to uh, I opened my Bible back to, Gen, to Matthew chapter 4. Forgive me. <laughs> you should be still in Genesis chapter 4. I didn't tell you to go back to Matthew, but I went there. Skip down. Pray with me. To Genesis chapter 4, Genesis chapter 4, uh, verse 20, Genesis 4, 20, it says, And Adah bore Jab Jabal, he was the father of those who dwell in tents and may and have livestock. His name, his brother's name was Jabal. He went, he was the father of all who play the harp and flute. As for Zillah, she also bore Tubal Cain an instructor of every craftsman in bronze and iron, and the sister of Tubal Cain was Nama. Okay, I need you to see something here. This is real good. This is real good. Notice in verse 20, we have livestock. Livestock represents provisions. Where is Cain? He's away from the presence of God. So some kind of way he has provisions that's not being provided by God. Next, verse 21. 
we have in this verse, we have entertainment or enjoyment is, is in the picture here. Verse 22, bronze and iron represents security. It also represents forming weapons of warfare. It's interesting though, the New American Standard Bible uses the word, instead of craftsman, it uses the word forger, forger, like forgery, right? Forger. So instead of craftsman, it's forger or arbiter is what the word actually means. Ar arbiter, right? Uh, no, artificier, ar artificier, artificier, artificier. Ar I'm, I'm repeating it for a purpose. Artificier. Do you hear that artificial? That's right. Artificial. It's a forger, right? The Hebrew word is more commonly associated with counterfeit or fraud in 2021. Let's put it together. The first world system was built away from the presence of God and it was counterfeit or we would call it a fraud. They had provisions, enjoyment, and security, but it was outside the presence of God. Those are the same ingredients of the world system as we know it in 2021. Mankind, apart from God, seeks provision, enjoyment, and security, but it's away from God's presence. In essence, this is what the city of Enoch represents in your Bible. It represents, so, so, so let, me, some, let, let, me, let me cut across the field. It represents the first kingdom of, the, of this world that was established. And it was established, notice, away from God. The city of Enoch represents the life of fallen humanity. You have provisions, entertainment, and security. Th these are what humans seek to possess in a world away from God. Provision, security, entertainment. This is what human seeing, the average human, be human being seeks in the world apart from God. Now, when you hear us talk about the kingdoms of this world, as you remember in, he in Ephesians chapter six, I'm just gonna give you the chapter. Principalities and powers of the air run the world systems or the kingdoms of this world. Principalities, powers, principal, pri principalities, powers. Oh man, I'm, I need to slow down. That's what I need to do. Principalities, powers, principalities and powers of the air run the world systems or the kingdoms of this world, i.e. principalities, powers of the air runs the political system in every country, not just this country, that country, or the other, in every country, because it's under the kingdoms of this world. Come back Wednesday. I'm going to break down these kingdoms of the world just, just a little bit more in order to help you understand what you're faced with. Somebody should be glad that Jesus didn't accept the devil's offer. Somebody watching this ought to be glad that Jesus didn't accept the devil's offering. Why, why, why? Tell me why, preacher. Had Jesus accepted the devil's offer, there would have been no need for him to go to Calvary's cross. That means you and I will still be in need of a redeemer. You and I will be still in need of a savior. Aren't you glad that Jesus didn't accept the devil? I'm getting excited. Jesus didn't accept the devil's offer, but he 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 rebuked him, so to speak, and said, no, no, no. Man, we, we are assigned. It's our job to worship the Father. It's we shall worship the Lord our God and him only shall we serve. See, Jesus knew if I yield to the devil's offer, I've got to serve him. But my assignment is not to serve the world systems or the devil. My assignment is to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. So is your assignment. See, Jesus would have been large and in charge in the kingdoms of this world, and you and I would still be lost or dead in our trespasses and sin. Aren't you glad? that Jesus refused the devil's offer. Now let's go back to Matthew chapter four, verse eight. Whatever, move that pen, move that remote control, move your arm out the way or whatever you bookmark there. Go back to Matthew chapter four, verse eight. Before, before I leave this thought, I got a couple things that I need to pick uh, quickly uh, point out here in Matthew chapter four, verse eight, and I'm gonna get out of the way. Let me read it again. It says, and the devil took him up on an exceeding high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of this world and their glory. I'm gonna put my Bible over here so I can show you that means that I'm trying to make my way out to the close. First of all, he, he they went up on a high mountain. 
on this particular high mountain, the devil was able to show Jesus all the kingdoms of this world. Can you think of a mountain on the earth that is high enough to see all the kingdoms of this world? Can you think of a mountain high enough that, that you can see all the kingdoms of this world? I know you're trying to think, don't stay there too long. Come on, stay with me, stay with me, stay with me. That indicates that where they went probably was spiritual, not natural. It probably was spiritual, not natural. Next, when did it happen? When did it happen? That's key. It happened after Jesus' baptism, after the baptism of Jesus. He came out of the water. He was led in the wilderness. Baptism under the old covenant connects to the Red Sea in the baptism under the new covenant connects to the Red Sea in the old covenant. Where did the children of Israel go after the Red Sea? Here's the answer. They went into the wilderness. Now, now get this. The children of the Israel, the children of Israel turned a, an 11 day journey into a 40 year experience because they failed the wilderness test. The children of Israel turned an 11 day journey into a 40 year experience because they failed the wilderness test. From Mount Sinai into uh, Canaan was a, an 11 day journey, 140 kilometers, a, an 11 day journey, or maybe 140 miles, but it was an 11 day journey. But because they failed the wilderness test, because they were disobedient, they stayed in the wilderness for 40 years. I need somebody to hear this. Don't extend your stay in the wilderness because you are not going to obey God. Are you hearing me? Now, the last thing I want to show you in this Matthew 4, 8 text, this word glory. In your Bible, so, so, so Satan takes them up, shows them all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. Don't miss it and their glory. So he shows them the kingdom, but not just the kingdoms. Let's take one, the plant the, the plant kingdom and the glory of the plant kingdom. That's just one. I covered seven last week. The plant kingdom and the glory of the kingdom. Or let's take the planetary kingdom and the glory of that kingdom. He showed them all the kingdoms. Well, the planetary kingdom probably wouldn't be considered the kingdom of the world because that, that's out of the world, but it does impact us. And I'm going to pick that up. Hope to get it Wednesday. If not, I get it next Sunday. It just depends on, on how deep we go Wednesday. In your Bible, glory is not just connected to God. David writes in Psalm 8, verse 5, that God crowned man with glory. So mankind has glory. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 29, Jesus spoke about the glory of Solomon. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 7, the apostle Paul says that man is the image and glory of God. He went on to say that woman is the glory of man. Why am I here? I'm here to show you that you and I have been crowned with glory, that Jesus, refer, Jesus himself referred to Solomon having glory. So I'm trying to show you man has glory, woman has glory. So if man has glory, if Solomon had glory, if if uh, we've been crowned with glory, then surely the kingdoms of this, this world has glory. Okay, well, what does that mean? Here comes, stay with me, stay with me. You're a good class. You ask some good questions. Here we go. The transliterated word here for glory, transliterated word here for glory is doxa. It means, get it, fame, glory, honor, radiance, renown, reputation, or splendor. I'm going to say it again because Pastor Newton's trying to write. He, he, he writes slow. Let me help Pastor Newton out. The word for glory is transliterated doxa. It means fame, glory, honor, radiance, renown, reputation, or splendor. So, so not only did the devil show Jesus the kingdom of this kingdoms of this world, he also showed him the fame, the glory, the honor, the radiance, the renown, the reputation, and splendor of the kingdoms of this world. So the kingdoms of this world also have fame, glory, honor, radiance, renown, reputation, and splendor. Therefore, we can put a 2021 spin on this to say, the devil said to Jesus, 
I will make you famous in the kingdoms of this world if you bow down and worship me. He could say, I will honor you in the kingdoms of this world if you bow down and worship me. He could have said, I will give you a great reputation in the kingdoms of this world if you bow down and worship me. He could say, I could give you some renown. I can make your name renowned in the kingdoms of this world if you bow down and worship me. I could make you radiant in the kingdoms of this world if you bow down and worship me. I will give you the splendors of the kingdom of this world if you bow down and worship me. More importantly, and we'll pick this up Wednesday, the devil is showing us the kingdoms of this world have their own glory, which means their honor, their radiance, their glory, their renown, their fame, their reputation, and their splendor. For, For instance, for instance, here's an example. Your bling, your blingage, your blingage, your blingage. So if you, some of you bling, this is the, you know, this stuff, bling, is probably from the kingdom, from the mineral kingdom. Your, you know, your, your, your blingage, your bling bling, as, as young people call it. You might not still call it that, but anyway, it's from the mineral kingdom. But again, come back for Wednesday. Come back Wednesday. Come back Wednesday. I'm going to deal with the glories of the kingdoms of the world Wednesday night. I'm going to deal with that. I'm going to start it. May have to wait till next Sunday to finish it. For, for now, though, for now, though, go to John chapter 1, verse 14. John chapter 1, verse 14. Uh, I, I thought that was my last turn before, but John chapter 1, verse 14. Go to John chapter 1, verse number 14. I'm making good time today. John chapter 1, verse 14. No, I'm not going to take my time. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be mindful. Uh, John chapter one, verse 14, John four one fourteen. it's familiar ask, actually for most of us. It says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. The writer of Hebrews tells us that Jesus is the express image of the glory of God. Jesus was a walking, living demonstration of the glory of the father. So, so, so the eyes of our understanding must be open so that we can behold his glory and our hearts must be open so that we can receive his grace and truth. Until our eyes are open to see the glory of Jesus, his kingdom will not be established in our hearts. Without the revelation of his glory, until we behold his glory, uh, until we seek the, uh, until we behold his glory, we'll seek the glory of the kingdoms of this world. Until we get this revelation that it's his glory that we must behold, and we have to refuse the the offer of the enemy to operate in the glory of the, the kingdoms of this world, it, we will continue to seek the glory of the kingdoms, kingdoms of this world until we understand that there's a greater glory than the glory of the kingdoms of this world. Said another way, let me say it another way. The more we behold his glory and the glory of his kingdom, the easier it is to uh, abandon or disconnect from the glory of the kingdoms of this world. So somebody's want to know, well, why is that important? Why is that important? Why are you talking about this? Why is this important? Here it is. Just as the father rules heaven by his glory, just as the heavens declare the glory of the Lord, Jesus rules the earth, the kingdoms on earth by his glory. That's why we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. See, beloved, the heroes of faith, when you look at the Hall of Fame of Faith in Hebrews chapter 11, they use their faith to advance the kingdom agenda, not to get stuff in the world system. They apply, they, they, they operate in faith. They, they, as the Bible talks about Abraham looked for a city. If you don't understand that, we are the city that Abraham was looking for. But they use their faith. Moses used his faith. All the heroes of the of the faith in, in Hebrews chapter 11, they used their faith to advance the kingdom of God. They, they, they were advancing the kingdom agenda, not just trying to get stuff to make them comfortable. I hope you're hearing what I'm saying. I hope you're hearing what I'm saying. They were not just trying to get stuff to make them comfortable. comfortable. So their priority was to do the work of the Lord during their lifetime. Think about this. How much are you praying for things versus praying for the advancement of the kingdom? In Psalm 8, David said, God has placed uh, placed all things under our feet. 
Psalm 8, David said, God placed all things under our feet. That means if it's a thing, I'm, I'm stomping my foot, it's under our feet. If it's a thing, since God's placed all things under our feet, if it's a thing, God has placed it under our feet. This, this is why Jesus could say, seek the kingdom and its righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Because the more you seek the kingdom, the more you walk in the power and the glory. And since you're walking in the power and the glory, all things are under your feet. Now, again, what's the last line of the model prayer? Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. In my, in my mind, that's another progression. First of all, progression. First of all, the kingdom is not meat or drink, but it's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. The kingdom means the king's domain. That means moving in, in, in the kingdom, uh, uh, moving in the kingdom speaks of moving in dominion. However, however, going with the last line of the model prayer, once we start moving in the kingdom, the next progression is to start operating in the power. From there, we progress to operating in, in the glory. So thine is the kingdom, power, and the glory. So the more we understand the kingdom and operate in the kingdom agenda, the more God bestows kingdom power on us. The more he bestows kingdom power on us, the more we see the glory of the Lord manifest in our midst. The glory of the Lord manifests in our midst when we see the power of God operating, causing things to happen in our earth and changing our earth. That's what we've been assigned to do. Oh, wait, I had one more turn. I have, I'm closing with this, though. I promise you, I'm closing with this. Isaiah, go back to back in your Bible to Isaiah chapter 40, verse 9. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 9. Uh, I hadn't been able to watch to see what you all doing in terms of you, if you if you're making comments or if you're doing any of that. I hadn't been able to monitor that. But anyway, turn to Isaiah chapter 40, verse 9. I'm about to get out your way. As I said earlier, like he did with Jesus, the devil is off offering you the glories of the kingdom of this world. The question is, will you accept his offer or will you resist him and pursue the kingdom agenda? Child of God, child of God, in these uncertain, unprecedented times, God uh, uh, wants to communicate and demonstrate his love to humanity through the sons and daughters who are hungry for the kingdom to come and the, his will to be done on earth. In these unprecedented times, in these uncertain times, God wants to communicate and demonstrate his love to humanity through sons and daughters like you and I who are hungry for the kingdom to come and the will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. He's looking for a people who, who have made up their minds to lift the broken and downtrodden out of the kingdoms of this world and bring them into the kingdom of his dear son. I said a whole lot right there. So let me read this Isaiah text and really get up out your way. Isaiah chapter 40 Isaiah chapter 40, verse number nine. Here's what it says. O Zion, Zion is a place, Zion is a people. Zion is the place of, of, of the overcomer. Zion des, des, describes people who are overcomers, okay? That's a whole lesson all by itself, but let me, I'm trying to get out of the way. O Zion, who bring good tidings or good news, right? Get up to the high mountain of O Jerusalem. You who bring good tidings or good news, lift up your voice with strength, Lift up, do not be afraid. Say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. Say to the cities of praise, Judah, behold your God. Behold the Lord God shall come with a strong hand and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his works before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom, and gently lead those who are with young. I need somebody to hear this, and I'm really getting up out of your way. Isaiah says, Zion, or that's the people of God. That's the overcomers of God. Zion. Zion should be herald, heralds or of the good news, or proclaimers of the good news, or good tidings. That's the gospel, beloved, that is the gospel. We should be heralds or proclaimers of the gospel, the good news. He tells us that the sovereign God is calling us to the high mountain, not to offer us the kingdoms of this world, but to strengthen us for our assignment. 
He's calling us to a place of rulership and reward where he will protect us, where he will shepherd us and feed us. I love the part where he talks about he will carry us in his bosom like a young lamb. This will only happen though, beloved, as, as, as we focus on his glory and not on the glory of the kingdoms of this world. One American politician said something this week and some folk thought it was controversial. And, and, and for a minute, I, w I was with them. I thought it was, no, 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 I don't agree with that. He, he said, the events that occurred at the U.S. Capitol Capitol on the 6th of January was everybody's fault. Stay with me now. Wait a minute. Don't Before you start giving me sad faces and, and frowns, before you start doing that, just, just, just hear me out. Hear me out. For those of you who have an ear to hear, hear me out. The church has made optional what Jesus made mandatory. The church has made optional what Jesus has made mandatory. Two things of that. Seek ye the kingdom, have dominion, make disciples. Those things Jesus made mandatory, but we make them optional. See, see, when we when we start to make disciples of the nation, when we start seeking the kingdom, not the kingdoms of this world and the glories of them, when we start seeking the kingdom and its righteousness, then we become a living demonstration of the glory of God. And we are drawing men unto Christ. Got it? I hope you got it. The, the more the body of Christ seeks the kingdom agenda and the great commission, the less we will see protests, riots, and violence in our streets. This will only happen, beloved, when we start to disciple the nations with a kingdom message through a kingdom lifestyle. I'm closing. This will only happen when we start to disciple the nations with a kingdom message, the message of the kingdom of heaven, through a kingdom lifestyle, not living for the king for the glory of the kingdoms of this world. I'm going to talk about the glories of the kingdom of this world Wednesday night. Hope you'll come by and be with us. But for now, let me let, let, let me let me invite somebody to faith. You're still watching this. You're still here watching this. And as you're watching this, you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. I want to invite you, beloved, to consider making Jesus Lord of your life. Secondly, you might be a backslider. You've been saved before, but your life right now is not a living demonstration of what a Christian should be like. I invite you to come back to the Lord Jesus Christ. Thirdly, you're in, you're in this area or you're somewhere around the globe watching us virtually. I invite you to co connect with us, the vision God has given me. I tell you, I'm uniquely qualified to, to pastor those that God connects with me and the vision he's given me to accomplish in this earth. Well, I'm, I'm out of time. I'm trying to get up out of here. I've been with you a little longer than I intended to be today. I'm out of time. You know I'm not out of thought. So I just want to, before we before I go, say to you, thank you. Those of you, we're putting links below. If you want to contact us, you want to connect with us, you want us to pray with you. I'm telling you, we're having a great time in prayer. Putting some links down below so that you can be a part of that. Now, those of you who are still here watching this and been faithful in your seed, your giving, your generosity, I thank you for your generosity. I thank you so much for your generosity. And I pray your faithfulness and your consistency. I pray that God will return a 100-fold offering, 100-fold blessing, I'm sorry, on your generosity. I thank you for you for submitting your time, your talent, and your treasure to the kingdom of God. This is good soul, and like the word of God. The word of God said, God's word will not return to him void, but God says he gives seed to the sore, bread, bread to the to the hungry, seed to the sore. But he says, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest. I'm declaring God's gonna give you a wonderful harvest on your generosity, your commitment of your time, your talent, and your treasure. Well, I've got to go. I'll see you tomorrow for our 5, 5 o'clock morning prayer. Then I'll see you again at 12 noon for our noon, 12 noon for our noontime nugget. Until then, God bless each and every one of you. Go be and do. Have a fantastic day in the Lord. Now the grace of God, the love of Jesus, sweet communion of the Holy Spirit, rest rule in our hearts and minds, now and forever. Amen. Go in peace and continue to serve our great King. I love you with the love of Christ. And again, I'll see you tomorrow.